All right, everyone. Hello. Welcome back. This will be part two of the How to Compose Like Stravinsky series, and we'll be focusing on Stravinsky's middle period, which was his neoclassical period, by taking a look at some of his scores from the period, analyzing them for harmony, form, and texture, and comparing them with some of the classical works from earlier centuries to see where he got his inspiration. So what we're going to be doing in this video, guys, is we're going to be taking a look at a piece by Haydn, specifically Haydn's 59th symphony, the Fire Symphony, the opening movement, to get an understanding of where Stravinsky was getting his inspiration. Then we're going to be taking a look at the first movement of the Dumbarton Oaks Concerto and comparing that to what we saw in the Haydn Symphony and how do these two pieces of music compare? Where did Stravinsky take inspiration in orchestration, in form? in harmony, etc. That way you'll be able to really get a sense of what neoclassical music is. And I just want to mention, guys, all the study scores in this video will be available on my Patreon for any level that you choose to subscribe to. From $1 and up, you'll be able to get access to all the annotated scores, all the markups that I've done. So would love to see you guys over there. There'll be other exclusive content. We're setting up a Discord server. Uh, I'll be doing chats and Q&As and polls, so please head on over to Patreon. You'll get access to all the study scores you see going forward in this video. Now, before we dive into the Dumbarton Oaks Concerto, we need to establish what is neoclassicism and what is classicism. Like, what was Stravinsky trying to do here? Where was he getting his inspiration? So to understand classicism, neoclassicism, and everything, we need to do a brief little bit of a lecture on music history. Now, if you're a more experienced musician or composer and you want to skip ahead to the purely theoretical stuff where I'll be breaking down various scores, I've put chapters and time codes in this video in the time bar below, so feel free to skip ahead to that if you're more experienced and know all this stuff. But for everyone else, I advise you to stick around because it'll help you understand the context of what's kind of going on in this period of Stravinsky's music. So neoclassicism, which was very much pioneered by Stravinsky and Eric Satie, was a reaction to romantic music. Now, if you guys understand um, common practice music history, the romantic era, which basically kicked off in the early 19th century with uh, Beethoven, Weber, uh, Schubert, and lasted till about at latest the 1920s with like Rachmaninoff, was a time of great exploration and grandiosity. A lot of the music of this period, and if you guys know, you know it's very emotional, uh, forms start to get looser and looser and more stretched out. Chromaticism starts to come in a little bit. And most importantly, the size of the orchestra during this era continued to get bigger and bigger and bigger and more grandiose to the point where you get something like Mahler's Eighth Symphony, the Symphony of a Thousand, where it's just a gigantic ensemble. And this was the era that Stravinsky actually grew up in. And now neoclassicism acted as, as a bit of a reactionary movement against this, a sort of call to order, as uh, Jean Cocteau, who was a famous French artist and philosopher and intellectual, called it when he was describing this new musical movement that was reacting against Wagner and Bruckner and Mahler and all these big, gigantic, bombastic composers. And the reason it was called neoclassicism and is because it really drew from classicism. Now, what is classicism? Classicism is very much associated with the classical era of classical music, specifically the music from, say, 1720 to about 1795, right? And basically, the aesthetics of this era, and if you know anything about music history, was very much on balance, order, and providing a sense of lightness and joie de vivre for the aristocratic patrons who inevitably were funding the production of this music. Again, it's a very different framework because before the Romantic era, musicians of this period were considered more artisans, not artists. Again, it's very subtle. There's a lot of great books on this, and I recommend you read. Specifically, Robert Geerden has a book on the study of Partimento, which while that's not necessarily a history textbook, the way he's able to describe, and Partimento, if you're not familiar, these are all kind of historical terms, was a method of instruction for students of this time. The point being is that his book does a great job describing of why students were instructed the way they were to fulfill these aesthetic goals of balance and clarity. So again, to, to bring it back to what I'm saying, balance, clarity, good taste, use of stock phrases, very much similar to the theater arts of the time in the Commedia dell'arte. It was all about providing the right restrained classicist 
class. I hate to use the word classy because it feels so wrong, but that was basically the idea was to provide this sense of poise and grace to the concert or the environment that the musicians were playing in. And this is, again, very different than the romantic sort of soul wrenching, bombastic music of of the of that era, Wagner, Bruckner and the composers I mentioned before. And if, but the thing about classicism also to note was in its music theoretical structure. Incredibly tonal, sonata form was practiced basically by the numbers. Now, of course, I'm going to put a giant asterisk here because if you've studied this music like I, like I have, you can find numerous examples of people doing really interesting things with, you know, minuet form, sonata form, the basic forms that were used, rondo, in this time. But generally speaking, for example, the first movement of a symphony or, uh, or an overture movement in this era would, of course, stick to the classic sonata form of introducing an A group theme uh, in, the, in the home key, modulating for the B group theme. This is during the exposition to the dominant key transitioning into a development that explored closely related keys, tonic, dominant, sub-dominant, sub-mediant, uh, before ending in the recapitulation in the home key and modulating that second theme group from the dominant to the home key. So all this stuff was very standard, and there was not this idea that you would stretch forms out into an emotional, to fit emotional needs. So what, so this is, and this is the era, of course, of, and just to put it simply, this is the era of Haydn, this is the era of Gluck, this is the era of Mozart, of course, this is the era of Baccarini. Th this is that era. The, I like to call it the powdered wig era, if you will. And basically, to bring it back to Stravinsky before we get into the analysis, what Stravinsky and other neoclassicists who followed in his footsteps, um, and also other progenitors, like I mentioned, Eric Satie, was what they tried to do was take all the harmonic innovations of their day, and I'm talking about the chromaticism, the meter changes, the odd, uh, you know, instrument pairings, and basically take all the innovations up to the point of the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, and 50s, and shove them into smaller ensembles and highly regimented forms. So as we're going to see with the Dumbard and Oaks concerto here, guys, Stravinsky calls for a very small ensemble. It's a chamber orchestra. This is not a bombastic Wagnerian orchestra. This is a small ensemble, but what he does with this small ensemble is he basically creates a cracked mirror version of like a Haydn symphony. One more thing I wanted to mention here, guys, is the specific era that Stravinsky ends up drawing from is actually a very, very interesting moment in time. To my ear, it sounds like he's pulling from music of the 1750s and 60s not the more famous years of that century when Mozart was composing the Prague Symphony, uh, Symphony 40, Don Giovanni, all this stuff. That's not the era to my ear Stravinsky goes to. He actually chooses an era that's at the tail end of another movement uh, called the Style Galant. Now, most of the times these days when people talk about the classical era, they kind of lump Galant music in with Mozart. But to my ear, the early Gallant music, which a lot of earlier Haydn symphonies kind of fall into, was this sort of bridge between the Baroque of, say, like, um, you know, a Handel oratorio or, or Concerto Grosso and classical music of the later uh, 18th century, like Mozart. There was this bridge period between, like, 1740 to seven, late 1760s that a lot of early Haydn symphonies were composed in. And that is the era, it's very interesting to me, that Stravinsky, in my to my ear, goes to for uh, inspiration because the ensembles were quite small at this time remember because people were transitioning out of the baroque era so a symphony in like 1762 would be like strings a horn and like two oboes and that's the kind of ensemble stravinsky uses in the dumbard and oaks concerto so that's a brief history of what classicism is versus romanticism and what neoclassicism is Again, if I could sum it up, and I know this has been a bit of a long preamble, but I feel it's important to explain it. Classicism is balance, poise, grace, good taste, joie de vivre. Romantic music is gut-wrenching, emotional, honest, raw kind of music. And then neoclassicism is taking some of the chromatic innovations that had happened at the end of the 19th century and then going back and forcing them in to more classical forms.
So without further ado, before we get into Stravinsky, I just want to take a brief look at Haydn's 59th Symphony first movement. Also guys, after we take a look at both Haydn's work and Stravinsky's work, I'm going to do a little bit of a recomposition. I'm going to take Haydn's 59th Symphony, the opening exposition, and recompose it in a way that kind of sounds, at least in my opinion, a little neoclassical, a little Stravinsky-esque to get even further in the weeds and show you guys how this kind of stuff is done. And again, it's all with the benefit of helping you guys as fellow composers be able to really take your influences and incorporate them. So, okay guys, here we go. As you can see here, I have my study score with everything marked up. We have the harmony on top. We have Roman numerals below. I've put in these little red bars here to signify when there is either a key change or a preparation or we're moving around harmonically. Additionally here guys, I've got these little white blocks. And again, if you go to my Patreon and the buy-in here is just a dollar for the first tier, every tier from that on up will get access to this and the previous Firebird study score. But anyways, if you take a look at these little things, I have notes here explaining sort of the ins and outs. Okay, so let's just take a look at what's going on. So the first thing we see right here and I want to just point out the orchestration briefly because this will be relevant to the Dumbarton Noakes Concerto. We have a very small ensemble. We have horn in A, which was common in Haydn's day to have horns in different keys like that. We have two oboes and then we have strings. Quite a lot smaller than even a later era classical symphony by Mozart in, say, 1788. People are not sure when this symphony was composed, but as you can see right on the top there, the idea from Haydn uh, anthologists is that it was sometime between 1766 and 1768, which tracks with exactly what I was saying about where I believe, what era I believe Stravinsky was taking inspiration from for the Dumbarton Oaks Concerto. All right, so enough talk. Let's get into the deep theoretical idea of what's going on here. So I'm just going to zoom in, guys, here. So I've labeled exposition here because clearly this is a classical, classical on the nose symphony. So right here we have this melody. Right? And so we have, again, if we're to break down the rough harmony, nothing too radical is going on with the harmony here. And I put a note here, primary theme group. This is theme group one. We're in the tonic key. So we have a melody outlining uh, the chord of A here. And then we have with this G natural here, we have A7. I've categorized as Roman, Roman numeral 5, 7 of 4 because following that right up, we have a D chord spelled throughout all the parts of the orchestra, an E7, which is five, landing back on A, doo -doo 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 -doo. and then we have that A7, five, seven to four, which leads us to D, we have the four, one, and now I've put here these little two red bars here to indicate we're preparing the dominant, because here we have five, seven to five, this B7, not diatonic to the key of A, but very common. I basically put these two red bars here to show you guys that this is a common trick used by classical era composers. We're preparing that five dominant chord. E. Right? And then we're back into that primary theme from theme group one, that. I've put this red bar here to indicate something is about to happen. And here again, guys, here's my notes right here. Transitory material leading to theme group two in the dominant key of E. So again, we have a classical symphony in A major here. So as we know the rules of sonata form, guys, this next theme group we should expect to come have different kind of thematic material and be in the key of E. And in my estimation, right here at this bar where I've put this red line, the beginning preparation for that comes. We have one, five, seven, one, dun, 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 right? So we have this kind of, this sort of building up theme with these 16th notes. We continue to going back between one, five, seven, one, five, seven. Now, when we get to B7 here, and again, I'm sorry, guys, the scan uh, from this particular edition seems to be a little screwed up, so you can't quite see. But what's happening here is we're outlining a B7 chord. That is a D sharp. I know it doesn't look like it because the lines are very, very, well, they're gone. But just trust me, that's a D sharp right here, and you can even see it down here in violin too. So we have B7. Now, this is not five, seven to five anymore. Now it's, I've marked it here as five, seven, because when we is leading, it's leading, it's leading, and then we land on E seven. So not quite one. Now we have five, seven of four, in my opinion. Now we have A four, right? And then Haydn takes us to F sharp seven. So we have five, seven of five in the new key of E, right? So then we land on B, we're at five. We're hammering five, five, 
five seven. So we have do 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 five five seven one din din, and then we kind of repeat this motif of bouncing back between one and five seven. Except now, guys, we've moved into that second theme group in the key of E, and we can look at this uh, theme here where my where my cursor is. This da 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 bim 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 as kind of the answer to the previous theme, which was de do de do 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 do. And I, again, I encourage everyone, um, again, I don't think I should be copyrighted for playing you examples from this, but you never know how YouTube works, guys. You can play a composition from 1532 and someone will claim it. I encourage you to go listen to Haydn's 59th Symphony um, on your own. It will become much more clear. I'm not gonna play it again because the copyright stuff is just a mess on YouTube, but anyways. So we keep we have this motif is a different theme, but the motif of movement between one and five seven, and I've indicated here there's a, a two four uh, six four two excuse me. So there's a bit of an inversion in the five seven here going on, one five seven one, and then I put these red bars again to indic indicate something interesting happening. And here's a note here, switch to parallel minor, and so we switch to E minor briefly for just two bars. Then we have this seven diminished seven of B. So now we've moved briefly, and I believe I have a note on this here. We have a brief switch to the key of B major here before continuing back into E major. So again, guys, even within this secondary theme group, we're moving a little bit. We have a couple bars of E minor. As you see here, guys, we go to A sharp diminished seven. Interesting choice. It shares that G natural from E minor, which we were just at, which is a little interesting because normally you would not have a fully diminished chord right here on seven for B. But again, I think it's because Haydn wanted to emphasize, and we see here that G natural, and it still leads quite smoothly into B. And we are briefly in the key of B until this next red bar, and when we return, and I put pivot here on this B7, we return to E, we continue on with a series of triplets. Now, I wanted to use this piece of Haydn's because for 1768, the use of these kind of triplets, I know it seems like not that radical at all to us, but it was a bit rhythmically interesting to have again not that radical to us maybe not even that radical 10 years later but again we're, i wanted to find the closest piece i could think that is like close somewhat in character to stravinsky's dumbard Oaks concerto of course they're not going to be close that much because of the harmony but i felt this haydn piece was very uh useful in that way and so guys basically I'm not going to go over everything here. Here we have the development, and I've marked up all the harmony here, and, and I've left some notes. So here we have the development, guys. I basically have left um, – here's all my – I have my notes here in these white boxes, and the, again, the red lines are here to <clears throat> – I even wrote D major here – indicate key changes and indicate uh, basically just harmonic – the kind of harmonic movement you see in a classical development. I'm not going to go over the whole – of Haydn's score here. The score, again, as I've said, will be available on my Patreon for anyone who signs up to study. But basically, I wanted to do this analysis here of Haydn's 59th Symphony to kind of show you what a classical symphony looks like. What does it look like at its purest, most unadulterated, so that we can then compare what is about to come next. So I hope you guys have gotten a brief idea of Haydn's symphony here. Absorb it. Notice the 1-5 movement. Notice the movement to the dominant key. Here I've written D major. We have so there's some subdominant key behavior happening in the development. Notice the series of augmented sixths used to move between keys here. I believe I have a note about this. Notice the presence of a series of augmented six chords indicates quickly shifting key centers. Yes. So again, very classical. One, five, submedian, uh, subdominant, augmented six chords. Get that feeling in your head. If you've listened, and again, some of you guys listening are classical musicians like myself. So you know all this. You've listened to Mozart a thousand times and you've listened to Haydn and Gluck and Boccherini and all these people. So you know the sound of this, basically. Now, we're going to go to the Dumbarton Oaks Concerto. And let's take a look at that now. And we will really see the contrast. Okay, guys, here it is. Here is the moment you've all been waiting for in this video. Here is Stravinsky's Dumbard and Oaks Concerto in E flat with my markup. I want to mention a few things. So this piece is in sonata form. The size of the ensemble is quite similar. Again, that's why I picked Haydn's um, uh, 59th Symphony. Quite similar. Interesting, we have three violins, three violas, 
two violins, uh, two cello, and two contrabass. Very interesting, but totally not out of character um, in spirit with something from the, that 1760s era I talked about earlier. But I want you guys to take note of how this piece starts. So notice the harmony on top here. E flat, B flat, E flat, B flat. Very similar, almost identical, you know, harmonically. We have one, five, one, five. And again, I want to make a point here, guys. You do not see Roman numerals here, and that is not out of neglect. There's a reason for this. While some parts of this piece can be understood using Roman numerals, as we get further and further along in this first movement, you will see, and I've made a note of it at, when we get to a certain bar, the idea of trying to relate Stravinsky's more chromatic and um, almost, I wouldn't call it atonal, but free tonal moments to traditional Roman numeral or let alone Shankarian analysis is a little futile. Uh, where it's applicable, I'll mention it in this video, especially in these early moments, it's actually quite applicable. But as we go further, guys, and I've made a note of it, you'll want to look at each bar or each uh, stanza on its own um, to understand what's going on. I'll get into that a bit more, but let's just focus on the, the beginning. So look at, we have here this, doom, 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 right? So, and I wrote imitation, uh, Stravinsky, there's a little bit of imitative stuff going on between the, the strings and the flute, uh, the woodwinds. And it's a very standard harmony. Now, but again, we're, this is neoclassical music, not classical music. So notice what happens right here on the fourth bar. And I've made a note of it here for you guys, meter change. Stravinsky immediately takes us out of any kind of traditional classical framework by doing this abrupt meter change from common time 4-4 four, four to 3-4. And that's not the only thing that's rhythmically and harmonically interesting that happens right away. As you see guys here, I've marked underneath the primary chords that are happening, which are a series of B-flat and E-flat chords with nines and a couple extensions. Notice here I've marked this little tiny F minor 7 here, here, and here. That's because Stravinsky, again, this is very neoclassical, very neoclassical, not classical. In the bassoon, in this second horn, and here in the lower strings, we get this stab of F minor 7 coming in over the main harmonic structure of it, specifically in this bar where I have the arrows here, in this bar of B flat nine derived um, melody. And it, again, this is an example of subtle, in my opinion, it's very subtle, polychordality, which we will see a lot of later in the Dumbarton Oaks Concerto. I mean, te technically, I, I think I've made a note of this here. Let me open it for you. Right, so polychordality is happening due to the F, se F minor 7 sforzando hits, right? Now, we could choose to spell this B flat 9 with the addition of this F minor 7 as like one big chord. But the way Stravinsky has chose to orchestrate this with this slight sforzando hit of these lower notes of this F minor 7, I view this as very polychordal. And it, 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 it's almost, in a way, a slight homage to the idea of something like the Rite of Spring, where Stravinsky, famously in the Augers movement, we know there's this, these two chords on top of each other. This uh, is, I believe it's e, e flat 7 and uh, E major on top of each other. Now, there's actually a way to spell that chord as one chord, as a sort of a, an E7 sharp 11 type chord. But Stravinsky and most music theorists and me would choose to see that as polychordality, as two chords stacked one on top of each other. Uh, this is much more diatonic at, at this moment. Later, we're going to get into some interesting territory. But when Stravinsky chooses to hit this F minor 7 here, and then again here in this bar of B flat, boom, we have now, uh, we have clarinet, we have bassoon, we have both horns, and we have the lower strings. Even as this, we have this dun 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 We have this F minor 7 hit. Again, and, and it doesn't matter as the harmony changes to E flat, boom, we have F minor seven. So again, we're in the key of E flat, so it's, it's two minor seven, but that's a very interesting thing and neoclassical thing that I've seen Stravinsky do in other pieces where he'll, he'll do these very Stravinsky-esque rhythmic hits that call back to something, like I said, like the right, like, you know, Petrushka or whatever, or, you know, but it's more tonal and more fitted in, albeit again, loosely, this is neoclassicism. We already have things happening here, including these hits, but it'll be more tonal, but it and fit into a more uh, structured form like we're about to see here. 
but it's still very Stravinsky. And that's the thing with neoclassicism, guys. You can pick and choose what you want to put in. Again, like I said, just to, Stravinsky starts us off with this melody that sounds very Mozart, sounds very early Haydn, but he injects what he wants into it, which are these his sense of rhythm. So again, that's the beauty of neoclassicism, right? And so I've made some more notes here, guys. We, we basically stay in this first movement. We stay quite tonal to E flat major, which gives us this, again, it's this homage to Haydn um, and that whole era. We have a minor plagal cadence. Again, and I want to mention just a, 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 a few things here. The woodwinds that are padding out right around here are much more dissonant than you would ever hear in a classical symphony. Um, this F minor 11, for example, we have one of the, horn, uh, excuse me, this high, this, uh, the, the flute here playing that B flat over an F, this F minor 11 type harmony with everybody else and, and uh, the, um, the, the melody being played in the viola <coughs> and violins, excuse me. And that just, that just wouldn't happen. The way these woodwinds are voiced, and if you listen to the Dumbarton Oaks Concerto, any good recording, it's so genius because it sounds dissonant, but it's not. It's not too dissonant. You know, an F minor 11 chord, uh, you know, you wouldn't hear that in classical music. It's not like a tone row or anything that's crazy. But uh, Stravinsky subtly does things like, um, now, for example, guys, I just want to make note here. So some of these things you're going to need to read in their key. So, for example, we have clarinet and E flat. We have horn and F. Um, so, for example, I just want to point out that um, right here, this is A flat. When you're studying the score, if you choose to to study my study score here, unfortunately these instruments are all in their keys. So if you're not good at reading, it might be a bit of a headache. But I'm just going to say here, this is A flat. Um, but that's just a side note. The point, I, the reason for bringing that up is we have A flat here and B flat, right? And to have this second right here between these two instruments, it's just not something that would happen. And again, these are the kind of things that define neoclassicism. We have, again, here in this first movement, odd meters, uh, odd Schwarzandi uh, rhythmic stabs, uh, <clears throat> odd harmony, nine chords, 11 chords, um, little mini harmony here, C minor and G minor are implied. Nonetheless, notice I want to point, this, point out this note here that I've written. Um, at this bar, at rehearsal, and I have the arrow blocking it, I believe this is rehearsal letter three. Yes, I believe this is rehearsal. Right here at rehearsal letter three, we still managed through all this chaos to move to the relative minor of C minor. Now, so we're still in theme group one. Some mod more modulation and craziness could have ever happened than in any other theme group, but we're in theme group one, and I just want to move on to, to emphasize what's going on here. So again, guys, I've we have harmony based still mostly around E flat. And again, a lot of these things, these themes here are variations on that opening theme cut up, uh, dim diminuted, expanded, and placed in these odd meters. Like for example, guys, again, this is just, I mean, neoclassicism can be defined by odd meters and certainly it is here by Stravinsky, but I just want to point out here, guys, we basically have a bar here of 916 that Stravinsky has divided for us the first half in 516, the last half in 28, right? And again, nothing to note here other than how odd that time meter is, right? Which again, gives the, the piece this um, off kilter feel. And here we have beat as four, um, which basically means, and these dotted lines in the middle of the bar, again, this is a bar of 916, but to try and write it like that, it would be very hard to see where each prominent beat is. So Stravinsky divides the bar for us. Again, that's something too radical in and of itself. I just wanted to point out that that's how one of the choice, this, these many different changing meters here, as we see, is just a tenet of Stravinsky's view of neoclassicism. And uh, I have a note here, let's see. Right, because, okay, so this is what I, so I, in my note here, as I've just seen guys, Stravinsky, is doing something I kind of like to call harmonic stretching. I'm sure there's a term for this. The D note, right, and I've put an arrow here, does not show up until late in this bar. Um, and at any moment in this bar, I've put B flat seven, I've put D seven, right? Because without this note, basically, right, we, we don't see this D till the very end. And while it happens at the end of the bar, our memory from the first half, we can remember this sort of B flat seven implication 
But by the time it arrives, as I've mentioned in my note, it's paired with this, um, you know, with this F sharp and with an A down here, and we get the sound of D7. So before our ears can establish this B flat seven ish sound that Stravinsky was um, implying, we're pulled to this D7 sound prominently when the all tones of the chord appear at once. So just a very interesting thing, and we're gonna get into more of this in a second, about how Stravinsky within a bar will use single notes to sort of stretch the ear in weird directions. And again, all within this classical form, this is neoclassicism. It's just very interesting. That's something for you to think about when you're composing is just to trick, I guess, if you wanna use that term, maybe not trick, but to to kind of hold back on solid harmonic implications. So what I wanted to note here, guys, and I have some notes, and again, all the chord symbols are on top, but as you can see here, things are starting to get a little wonky, right? You see I've written F minor and F major seven, uh, F minor and F, right? So, and so, okay, this is one thing I wanted to mention. This is a note here, and I mentioned, as you can see, David Bruce has mentioned, because he actually talks about this in his video on Stravinsky's harmony. In these bars here, we have both major and minor thirds appearing within the same bar, confusing the idea of like, wh where, what are we doing? Which is why I ended up writing F minor and F major seven. As you see here in this key signature, we're in the key of E flat, so, you know, A flat, right? But then just at the end of the bar here and earlier, Stravinsky's like, no, here's an A natural. And also, by the way, here's an E natural. But just kidding, because here's this A flat right after it. You know, this is that harmonic stretching I feel like Stravinsky likes to do to the listener in a quick, you know, not across bars or, or whatever, within a, a bar. We have, again, right here, I think a perfect example of this would be here we can look in the violas here or we can look in the cellos here. We have, you know, B, A natural, A flat, G. Here's A flat again and then A natural, right? And then it, it kind of happens in the violas here. We have A natural and A flat right next to each other. And I've made this note to highlight that Stravinsky loves to mix the thirds of whatever tonality he's on, whatever chord or rough harmony within a key he's in, to really stretch the ear and confuse it, while still making it so that the piece does not veer in to utter atonality. And on that note, I've made a note right here that basically I wanted to point out, as you can see in the chord symbols, because of this mixing of major and minor thirds, as I indicated, we're starting to get into a point in the Dumbarton Oaks Concerto where trying to analyze the piece with chord symbols, let alone Roman numerals, is becoming a bit futile. And I made a note here, the best way to understand this piece is to look at it horizontally going forward from where we are here, uh, where my mouse is, instead of uh, vertically, i.e. sort of look at it almost as you would a counterpoint exercise and try to understand the relationships between the voices rather than trying to derive chords. I've still done my best throughout the study score to derive chords the best I can. That being said, when you see the chord symbols I've placed over um, the bars going forward after around rehearsal letter six where my mouse is, uh, rehearsal letter five also is a good place to start, I would simply say take them with a grain of salt because as I mentioned, Stravinsky uses this mixing of major and minor thirds within a bar, which is why you get uh, you know, F minor and F on beats three and four and F minor and F major seven for this whole bar after uh, rehearsal number five, that it becomes almost futile. We can still derive some harmony, but it's best to look at the whole thing horizontally. Now, here's a big move here, and, and I've made a note of it here, and I wanna talk about it further. As we enter theme group two, and again, remember, this is a sonata form. It's a neoclassical sonata form, so we're not playing by the rules, but we are acting in a way somewhat loosely structurally that imitates Haydn's earlier uh, first movement from the 59th symphony that we looked at. So what I've put here is that what's interesting is the way we end the first theme group is we do a chromatic median move to the leading tone of the home key of E flat and major. Now, as, as we looked at in Haydn's symphony, what you would do here is you would go to the 5-7 if this was 1762, as I mentioned. But in, in, uh, in 1938, that's not what happens. But what is clever is, like I said, by landing on the 5 chord here, B flat, of that home key, 
it almost feels like, oh, are we going to are we going to be flat major? Are we actually going to do the traditional thing? But then no, Stravinsky deceptively moves us to the leading tone key through chromatic medium. But it's so brilliant because we have this crazy sort of uh, uh, I, I'm not going to use the word chaotic, but sort of s feel where it's like, where are we going? Are we going to the five? Oh, no, we're not. But we're still kind of going somewhere closely related to the home key, but in the weirdest way, because, you know, D major, what the heck? That's like pretty far away in terms of close relations from E flat major, except that it is the leading tone. So it does have that incredibly close relationship of the need to rise uh, as a tone. But we move into the key, and it's just brilliant. And uh, I just want to point out that here, um, doom, 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 dee, do, 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 do. So as you see here, guys, pretty sta pretty tonal chord um, names are happening on the uh, uh, above these bars because we do move again. The brilliance of the Dunbar and Oaks Concerto, and I just want to make this point is that. Um, it mixes this freeish tonality with straight tonality at just the right moment. So when we move to theme group two of this exposition via that chromatic median, we return to a highly tonal theme similar to how the first, um, you know, the first 12 or so bars of the piece started, which is a, a, a welcome reprieve and a perfect contrast to the, the sort of loose tonality and this, and this sort of crunchy, uh, 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 dissonant, odd metered sort of um, extension of the first theme group that we saw leading up to this. And that's the brilliant thing about Stravinsky's neoclassicism, if we're trying to be influenced by it, right, guys, is that Stravinsky was very uh, sort of had the perfect taste of when to go sweet and tonal and Haydn-esque and Mozart-esque and when to be more of himself and insert a lot of dissonance. Uh, into a piece. But again, here we have very standard uh, movements. I didn't put Roman numerals again because I was apt not to because of how quickly we slide out of being able to use them applicably. But as you see here, you know, D, A, D, we have one, five, one, you know, we have six minor, four, you know, five, five, four. You know, again, it very standard, very Mozart, very Haydn, very Boccherini, uh, Gluck. And then we even have a bit of an augmented six kind of thing going on here, D7, and we have a, you know, we could call this, we're kind of hammering on D7 here. It almost feels like we're going, uh, you know, five, seven, four, and then let's scroll ahead here, folks. And we just kind of hammer, and again, it's sort of like, it seemed like well, we would go, if we were in a typical classical symphony, we'd move to, uh, to G, but that's not what happens here. We actually return to the home key for the development. And again, I, I might have mentioned this in the Haydn uh, analysis, but if I didn't, let me get to it. The, um, the traditional thing you would do at the end of a uh, first movement of a symphony in the classical era is you would t typically start the development, uh, perhaps after a coda, perhaps not, in the key you ended in, meaning you would, in the Haydn, uh, we started in, a, in e, e major, in the key of A. But here... Stravinsky chromatically by half step moves us back towards the home key of E flat and the development starts in E flat starts in the home key after we took the leading tone key for the second theme group neoclassicism guys neoclassicism and I believe I made a note of it here yes development starts in home key as opposed to the key of the second theme group right so we didn't even continue in D major Stravinsky yoinks us back to uh to um to E flat uh, uh, a major, and we and we hang on a, a two eleven chord here. We have a bit of an F minor eleven going on here because again, uh, um, based on this sort of this F minor chord outlined here in the woodwind, and then we have of course this B flat here in violins two, kind of giving that eleven type feel, and that goes on for a while. And again, I want you guys to notice that especially I'm pointing sorry with my finger you can't see it but right here I'll scroll with my mouse this da 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 da, da. these are all fragments in the traditional classical Mozart-esque Haydn-esque uh, way of taking thematic material from the opening theme groups and and putting them through the development I mean look here we here we are again with my mouse we have so many fragments here uh, uh, you know the, the use of fragmentation uh, and then even you could even uh, these little hits here excuse me on G, again, 
it's it, it's maybe you could call it a stretch, but I would say because they happen towards the end of each bar and they're quite quick and they're not sforzando, but they almost do a slight callback to that F minor seven stab we mentioned earlier in the piece, and uh, you know and and again, as as you'll see in my study score, guys as we try to categorize things vertically, which I don't think is the best way to analyze this, I believe that everybody should go in and analyze this horizontally, voice against voice, and see the instances of when things are major and when they're minor. And oftentimes that could be a 16th note apart, guys, in Stravinsky's neoclassicism. Tonality shift that quickly here. But I, I, I put here D11 with major 7, right? So D11 already is odd. Like you just, for me, to voice... Um, any kind of major chord with just 11 above. So that clash of that minor second. Um, you know, I studied a bit of jazz theory as well. And of course, you know, if you talk to jazz people, they'll say, you know, it's sharp 11 on major, um, you know, any kind of major tonality chord, dominant seven or otherwise. Yet Stravinsky here uh, puts the 11 against the, the major third with major seven. So we have dominant seven and seven, three and four right next to each other. And again, it's just crazy, crazy goodness. You know, a lot of dissonance, fantastic stuff happening. Some minor major implications of minor major nine chords here. Yes. So, and here, guys, here's another thing I wanted to point out with my notes. I have it here. So, neo, the thing about neoclassical music, and I had mentioned Stravinsky specifically took from the Galant era, the pre-classical music era of early Haydn symphonies, people like C.P.E. Bach and whatnot, for his inspiration. And the thing about that Galant era is there were still some aspects of Baroque music in the in that music because it was the transitory period and what i put in my notes here guys is that one thing that's interesting about this is that stravinsky uses um almost a baroque technique from the concerto grosso uh, called concertino so in in baroque concerto grossos which were uh, almost sort of like again we can think of them as forefathers to symphonies kind of or forefathers to concertos or chamber music they were kind of a mix between chamber music and the symphony because it's the Baroque era and there just wasn't, you know, the kind of symphonies we think of today. But what would often happen is there would be a group of soloists that would play the more virtuosic melodic material. And it could be two violins and a flute. It could be, I mean, Bach famously used the harpsichord as a concertino instrument uh, and so did Rameau uh, to highlight, especially not necessarily in concerto grossos, but in their trio sonatas. Um, basically, the, basically, the concertino group was like taking a trio sonata and inserting it into a bigger ensemble and highlighting it. And the ripeño uh, was when the entire group played together. It's almost like a Baroque version of a, of tutti a little bit. Um, and the point is, is that here in this section here, we have just strings. And we can almost think of the string section of this, uh, of the Dumbarton Oaks Concerto, as a bit of a concertino group here, because uh, prior to this, everybody is mostly playing, uh, not all at the same time, but everyone is sharing material relatively evenly. And then when we get to this section here, guys, uh, the strings take over and become a bit of a concertino group in uh, the Dumbarton Oaks Concerto. And even <laughs> we have a fun little thing like a stray harmonic here. Uh, the tonality becomes, again, a little bit more clear, as you can see by my notes above. We're able to label chords a bit more accurately. Again, still shying away from using Roman numerals here, guys, because I feel that when <laughs> we run into freer tonality, it gets a little confusing um, for people I have found when trying to explain this. Though you're welcome to put Roman numerals as you see fit. I just felt that for the purposes of this piece, it would be best to try and avoid that though there's certainly Im Roman numeric implications in the chord relations. <clears throat> and uh, as you can see here, guys, we just continue through relatively tonal and, uh, uh, harmony with, uh, of course, the odd meters of Stravinsky. But I would just say, guys, whenever you see F minor 9 or something like um, B augmented 7 or D flat augmented, Stravinsky will often place any kind of, um, like I said, I mentioned this earlier, but any kind of seconds, any kind of tritone, uh, tritone, any kind of tritones or, uh, you know, anything that's kind of crunchy, he will place it closer than you would ever place it in the classical era. And, and it, similar to his work in the Russian era that we talked about last time. So that's just something to be aware of when you see F minor nine, it will not, it will not be voiced. Oh, it will not be voiced in a way you would traditionally think of as highly melodic. Uh, if we're talking about the common practice period, but it will be voiced, uh, in the Stravinsky way. And so as we get to this point, guys, I didn't label it, but the recapitulation is beginning. Um, again, it, we're in neoclassical, so 
Again, we have sort of some, we have basically a lot of fragments of the opening movement come back. Right. And so this recap is not exactly super traditional. Um, but as you see here, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry, guys. Navigating these PDF files can be so interesting. So as we can see here with my notes, recap ends with connective material to the next section. This is uncharacteristic of classicism as the movements were often quite evenly delineated. And that's very true because um, here you can see um, dum -dum 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 -dum, there's some fragment fragments of the um, the opening movement for sure. Again, here we are right here. Again, there, there's material from the, the opening movement coming back. The, the, the second theme group is here quite a bit. Um, but ultimately, the recap serves as more connective material to this second, to the Allegretto second movement right here. If we look at this analysis, the things we want to sum up from it are we can take uh, a mixture of tonality, odd meters, uh, some polychordality and polytonality based on uh, Stravinsky's mix, based on things like those early Sforzando chords we saw, and the mixing of major and minor thirds within a bar. I haven't talked about orchestration much because it's, it, you know, it's that relatively straightforward classical orchestration, not harmony, of course. But um, yeah, if we can think about, we can also think about, uh, importantly, um, seconds, things like seconds, things like uh, uh, right next to each other, usually voiced in woodwinds. We can think about um, things like voicing uh, tensions you wouldn't think, like 11s on dominant chords. And again, polytonality, as I mentioned earlier. So that's kind of the Stravinskyan version of neoclassicism. There's a lot of people who explored neoclassicism, Satie most uh, prominently. But a lot of people had different forms of neoclassicism. And I, as I mentioned, the great thing about it is that you can incorporate whatever kind of musical textures you want into these classical forms. And that was so, that's what was so dynamic about the movement in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, and 50s, and what you know, appealed very much to Stravinsky. So as you guys can see here, uh, we've looked at Haydn as the model of a classical symphony. Then we've looked at how Stravinsky kind of twisted it with a tonality, meter, uh, rhythm, uh, you, know, uh, you know, going to the leading tone on the second theme group, things like that. Um, and now I want to do something kind of interesting. I, wanted, I took Haydn's, the exposition from Haydn's Fire Symphony, and I recomposed it in a way to sort of imitate Stravinsky's work here on the Dumbarton Oaks Concerto. So what I thought I would do, guys, here is we just listen to that briefly, look at the sheet music, and kind of show you what I did, and then, you know, just to really hit home how neoclassicism works and how Stravinsky's neoclassical era came about. So I thought we'd check that out, and uh, yeah, we'll fly over to that and take a look over there. So hey, all right, guys, so here we are. So what I've chosen to do, as you can see, is I've chosen to recompose Haydn's 59th Symphony, the Fire Symphony, in the style of Stravinsky's neoclassicism from 300, 200 years later. Now, I've just taken the exposition and put it through some sort of slight pseudo Stravinsky and transformation, but as you can see, we've already taken some influence from the Dumbarton Oaks Concerto and applied it here. Right off the bat, we have, in bar three, we have a meter change, in bar four, another meter change, and then down here where my cursor is scrolling, we have major and minor tonalities clashing with each other based on what's going on in the woodwinds and below in the strings. And as we continue on forward, you will see again more meter changes. Uh, we have the fragmenting and chopping up of Haydn's initial theme, which again, you should definitely go listen to if you haven't heard. But what I'm gonna do is play you an MP3 of a MIDI recording of this so you can get an idea of what it sounds like to transform, to transform something that's classical into something neoclassical. So here we go. So let's take a listen right now, guys. Thank you. 
<laughs> right. Got to love MIDI. Um, so what I wanted to show there, guys, and I, I followed along in the score so you can kind of see where we're at, is you notice how throughout this recomposition of Haydn's uh, exposition of the first movement of the Fire Symphony, I chose to specifically let certain moments play out closer to Haydn's original composition, um, and other moments I chose to insert specific dissonance that was quite apparent. One of my favorite moments is right here where my cursor is scrolling. We have a bar 30 right here, so right around bar 31, um, this sort of interplay between the oboes and violins, we could call this again a concertino group right here happening, a little bit of a trio. Um, I really just love the way that it sounds when you put it through a Stravinskyan neoclassic neoclassicist uh, um, dissonant transformation. I almost maybe like it a little more uh, than, well, I'm not, uh, let me just make it clear. I'm not saying I like my composing better than Haydn's. That would will never happen. But what I'm saying is that I, I really like the idea of how it's, I really like how it sounds when you take some of Stravinsky's principles and apply it to these old compositions from the 1760s. It just sounds great to me. And so I, I hope that you guys can take a look. And again, this score will also be available on my Patreon um, for all tiers starting with just a dollar a month. Um, just wanted to, I just want to point that out because I was going to say, this video is not the only place you can you can study this. You can take a look at this score and see some of what I did and how it mirrors or doesn't mirror uh, some of the choices Stravinsky made in the Dumbarton Oaks Concerto. Um, and I just want to, yes, I just want to highlight one more time, guys. Right, so that part was the part I wanted to highlight that I really felt I was able to capture what it would sound like if Stravinsky had been involved in this composition. So again, guys, to wrap this whole video up, which I'm sure at this point it's close to an hour in length, um, neoclassicism, I know it's going to be a kind of a simple thing, is taking the elements that made classicism so great and different as compared to romanticism with its balance, with its poise, with its uh, sense of uh, dimensions and apply whatever you want. In this case, it was Stravinsky's unique sense of harmony and dissonance, but that does not need to be the case. Uh, certainly, there's been plenty of other neoclassicist composers who've incorporated things like folk music from the Caucasus and, uh, into their music. Uh, I think a lot of sometimes of someone like Hovhannes, who was certainly not neoclassical, but often used um, Armenian influences in sort of somewhat not all, not all of it, some, not all of his compositions were structured like this, but a few did use some sort of vague sonata form. And uh, you know, I've even heard people take things like you know, rock-inspired melodies, you know, with a lot of uh, five chords, uh, and place them inside these types of sonata sch uh, schemes. So the point is, guys, from exploring Stravinsky's neoclassical period, we can see that neoclassicism is a, almost a, a wellspring that springs eternal. Whatever kind of different influences you want to bring to these forms of uh, the minuet, uh, the sonata form, uh, the ternary, the rondo, these forms, the theme and variation, um, just it, it's a, a great place to, to stretch your sort of creative um, composing mind. And with that, I want to thank you all for joining me for the second episode of this series, Exploring the Music of Stravinsky. Please subscribe. Please go to Patreon and get access again to all the scores here. And stay tuned because... The next episode will be the final in this How to Compose Like Stravinsky series. We're going to be taking a look at the late serial period. Specifically, I haven't decided the piece yet, but I'm leaning towards taking a look at Stravinsky's composition, The Flood, which is personally one of my favorites. So please tune in for that. I'll make an announcement if the composition choice changes. And I really appreciate your time and support. And I hope that I was able to help illuminate some of uh, this music for you and you learn something and you will be able to use it in your own compositions uh, until next time keep until next time keep composing music keep loving music and creativity and I'll see you later bye bye